I heard a glass of wine can prevent cancer, or does it cause cancer? I don't think this video is about scolding those people that love and care and those people that have misstepped with their words. Have you tried yoga? Yeah, I have. I think this is really about the NBC community having a good laugh. Have you swam in Lake Tiki Taka? Tiki Taka? <laughs> Hi everyone, and thank you for attending tonight's virtual Hot Topic Mentor Session. We hope you'll also um, join us on Thursday and Friday evenings as well. First, we'd like to say thank you to all of our wonderful funders, AACR, Agendia, the Do Joe W. and Dorothy Dorsett Brown Foundation, ESI, Genentech, Genomic Health, Merck and Company, Novartis Pharmaceuticals, Corporation, Pfizer, Santa Fe Genzyme, Seattle Genetics, the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, and Vertas. Tonight's session will start with each mentor providing an overview of a specific session or sessions. Following the overview, we will open up for discussion for questions, so be sure to include your comments and questions on the Alamo Breast Cancer Foundation's Facebook page, comment section, <laughs> and on their website as well. Please don't hold your questions until the end. When you think of them, type them and send them in. Um, before I introduce our mentors for the evening, we would like to thank them for giving so generously of their time and knowledge. We love each and every one of them. We would like you to know how much we appreciate you and your continued support of the program. Um, introducing them starting in the order that they're going to be speaking. First is um, Dr. Jenny Chang. She's from Methodist Cancer Center, Houston, Texas. Dr. Judy um, Garber, she's from the Data Farber Institute. Dr. Susan Love, she's from the Susan Love Foundation. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Douglas Shee from Masonic Cancer Center, University of Minnesota. And I'll pass it on to Dr. Chang. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, 
I wanted to just start off by saying I, I re recognize, we all recognize how hard this is for everybody. Um, and I, I cannot personally imagine what it's like to be going under cancer treatment in the middle of COVID. But there is an end in sight, I hope, uh, with the vaccine. I, I have my vaccine all scheduled for in two weeks from now. Um, but uh, until then, I think, you know, it, it behooves us to be safe. And um, again, uh, my prayers are with you guys as we go through this very difficult time. Um, I would like to start actually by a very exciting topic, which is the CDK46 inhibitors. Uh, it's, it, we had a, a lot of presentations today, and this is used in patients with estrogen receptor positive cancer. And there has not been a lot of you know, new targets, new treatments. And when the CDK46 inhibitors came out a few years ago, it was tested in the metastatic setting. And there are three main CDK46 inhibitors. Uh, the first on market is a drug called Ibrands or palbocyclib. The second, ribocyclib. And the third, um, is, uh, abemocyclib. So there are three uh, cyclips, the CDK46s. And when the uh, results were shown in metastatic patients, what we saw was a doubling of progression-free survival. And it was really, really exciting. The hazard ratio was 0 0.5. That means a double progression-free survival. And everybody was really, really excited about these new class of drugs. For, and for the first time, we actually had new treatments that we could give um, women with uh, ER-positive breast cancer. And today, you know, um, estrogen receptor positive or hormone receptor positive breast cancers are the, still the most common, and more people um, uh, if they succumb to breast cancer, succumb from ER positive breast cancer. So we're all very excited about these new class of drugs. And then this was then and taken in COVID, the set of results uh, started coming out um, and uh, and it was with the first uh, uh, class, uh, first drug, which is uh, palbocyclib. And uh, those studies basically did not uh, show a benefit uh, in early breast cancer patients. Um, and, uh, and everybody was terribly disappointed, to be very honest. Um, and uh, again, an ASMO this year, again, in the middle of COVID, um, abemocyclib released its results um, and was presented in ASMO. And it showed that you could actually, in early breast cancer patients, abemocyclib looked as if um, it actually improved um, the hazard ratio and improved survival in patients with ER positive early breast cancer patients. And so there were three studies presented today, uh, one with abemocyclib and two with palbocyclib. Um, generally speaking, the abemocyclib at earlier time prime, it was, it was done at, at two years and three years earlier, um, it was interesting that you did have an improvement in survival in patients who received, in addition to uh, endocrine therapy, they received, also received a benefit. Now, the palbocyclib studies were, were not positive. They did not show a benefit. So uh, we were trying to rationalize this, whether this is because the benefit is a superior drug, which is possible, or that the time, for, the time that we treat, uh, uh, that it was too early to tell because it, it was an earlier readout of the Abema cycle studies. So the jury is still out. Um, I know it's out with the FDA to see whether we get approval. Now, I want also to move on a little bit because then Dr. Pat presented some very exciting data. You know, and, and what it, it basically alludes to is, as we know the triple negative breast cancer, not all good neck breast cancers are alike. The same goes for uh, ER hormone receptor positive cancers. So instead of looking at just bad biology, meaning, I mean, instead of just looking at whether or not the, the cancers move to the lymph nodes and whether it's stage, you know, stage three, we need to basically look at the biology of ER positive breast cancers to see whether we can unpack the pathways that may actually enable ER positive breast cancer patients to respond to CDK46. And I'm sure we can get there. Um, because knowing the mechanism of how CDK46 inhibitors work, which is to push cells into being quiet, to stop cycling, to stop proliferating, we can figure out just, you know, which sets of ER positive breast cancer patients may benefit. So I'm actually very hopeful with all these results. The abemocyclic data for early breast cancer patients is still positive. Um, and, uh, and even if the curves we meet uh, later down, I believe that we can actually um, uh, understand the biology of those who benefit and then design studies for the 
higher, highest risk um, biologically uh, relevant uh, subset of ER positive breast cancer patients who basically needs to, need, need the treatment the most. And ultimately, the, I, the idea here is to improve uh, cure rates and, and, and basically prevent metastatic ER positive breast cancer, which today uh, remains the major challenge for many of our patients. Dr. Garber, you want to take it? Sure. So I um, will summarize. This is making a little louder. I'll summarize some of the um, talks today that uh, were in the prevention realm, and um, they were some of them in the session on prevention. One of them was uh, actually two of them were award talks. So um, just to update you a little bit, I don't think there was anything earth shattering, but they were still interesting summaries. So the first was from Dr. Hankinson this morning. She won the AACR Investigator Award, and it's nice to see it go to a woman and nice to see it go to an epidemiologist. She has spent her career trying to sort out the complicated relationships between hormones and breast cancer. And she certainly looked at estrogen um, and showed many times using the large nurses health study cohort, which is now several hundred thousand women, that estrogen levels in postmenopausal women were related to breast cancer risk. I think we've all known that, but it's been hard to measure precisely because as you know, in postmenopausal women, estrogen levels are quite low. She also showed that testosterone levels are related to breast cancer risk. And this is often a question when women are thinking, do they take something to try to improve libido? Um, and is testosterone safe? And I wouldn't say, and Sue did not say that we have answered that question, because one of the interesting things is that testosterone is metabolized to estrogen. So you're not really sure if it's the testosterone or if it's estrogen itself. She also has studied prolactin, which, you know, you think prolactin is a, is a hormone that's involved in nursing. So you'd think it's only important perhaps a few times for a few months in one's life. But in fact, um, that's not necessarily true. It's measurable over the lifetime and its levels are related to risk. They have gotten much more sophisticated in trying to predict breast cancer risk, not only hormone levels, but also, of course, mammographic density now and some genetic markers. And that they, they are still working on improving the models for the general population, not just for women who have particular family histories or particular genes. These are so-called SNPs or personalized risk scores, which we will definitely be hearing more and more about. These are ways of looking at large numbers of genes that we have with lots of variations in populations and in panels of genes that can determine breast cancer risk. So I think Sue um, gave a nice summary of where the field is. And if you listen to her talk, and since now you can go back and listen to all the talks, um, that, that's what you'll hear about. The session on prevention was structured uh, across three different very different areas of focus. One was Melinda Irwin, who has studied exercise and diet uh, for several, many years now, I guess she's a senior investigator at Yale. And she talked about uh, not just ways in which diet and weight management have been important in breast cancer risk and in breast cancer outcomes, including uh, looking at ways that affect how much chemotherapy is actually delivered. Um, and her question really was, is it time to integrate both exercise and um, weight management up front into breast cancer care? And of course, she thinks it is. Um, and she did show that there are moves to try and include both counseling about weight reduction and strategies for weight reduction. And, and pointed out that even primary care physicians now can be reimbursed for counseling about weight. And since we all know that in breast cancer treatment, struggles with weight are ubiquitous uh, almost and are clearly related to the interventions themselves. Um, this I thought was, it was interesting to hear her really become an advocate for all of us working more directly in, to help our patients with this set of challenges. 
The second talk there was from Connie Lehman, who is a very interesting breast imager at the Mass General Hospital in Boston. And Connie has been working with Regina Barzley, who is a scientist at MIT, to try to get more out of mammograms. So, you know, we've spent many years thinking about how to improve breast imaging. All of our technologies have limitations. <clears throat> Excuse me, we don't like the injections with MRI. We certainly don't like the discomfort of mammograms or their lack of sensitivity, the things that they miss. So now is the time to try using artificial intelligence to get more out of the images. And that's the project that they're using, not only to see if they can see better, can they detect more, even in dense mammograms, but uh, Regina thinks that she can predict where breast cancers are developing in imaging long before they are routinely seen on mammograms. And Connie updated us on progress in the field. It's a very interesting talk. It's a little dense but I think she does a good job of explaining it to most of us who are uninitiated on this technology. And the third talk was by Powell Brown, who's uh, really one of the senior people in uh, breast cancer prevention. And he gives a very nice review of all the efforts trying to prevent breast cancer, not just hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Um, so he talks about tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors and um, the low dose tamoxifen studies that were discussed here last year. Um, but also about vaccine trials that are being done in um, some in HER2 positive and some in triple negative breast cancer. Now, of course, we're not very good at figuring out who's at risk for HER2 positive breast cancer yet. Um, and I think it's early days on vaccine trials, but there's certainly tremendous interest in trying to use our own immune systems to protect us rather than chemo prevention using drugs that have different kinds of side effects. Um, not to say that vaccines will not have side effects. We are not talking about COVID vaccines, and uh, we are not talking about flu vaccines, I, which I hope, both of which I hope you're having in the reverse order. Um, but anyway, it's, it's interesting to see the field trying to evolve toward an immune approach, which is much more difficult on, in prevention where you don't have targets in the same way that you do for immunotherapy, no pdl ones So we'll see what happens with that. Um, just two other quick things. Mary Claire King got the McGuire Award this year. That was certainly appropriate for someone who's been a real giant in the field of cancer genetics. And she gave a very elegant talk about BRCA1 and, um, and BARD1, two genes involved in DNA repair. She talked about the fact that Bill McGuire, when she met him, tried to convince her that BRCA1 should be a gene involved in estrogen metabolism, which Certainly many people might have thought when people were looking. Of course, it turned out that was not what BRCA1 does. But Mary Claire told a very nice story of the connection uh, between these in that BRCA1 and BARD1 seem to increase the damage, uh, to, the, to increase estrogen metabolizing genes, which cause DNA damage in the cells. And then BRCA1 and BARD1, when they are not working properly, are unable to repair that damage. So she tried to make the connection between BRCA1 and BARD1 and estrogen, which maybe helps to address the question that's often been asked, why are BRCA1 and all of the related genes, which are so important in repairing DNA errors in many cells, why do they lead particularly to breast cancer? Uh, not only breast cancer, but also breast cancer, maybe this estrogen story is a piece of it. And at the end, she made her uh, regular plea because this is really something that she believes in uh, very passionately and has tried to help make tr come true. She believes in testing um, all women in the population at age 30 genetically to find carriers since uh, almost half of uh, women who are found to have a BRCA mutation have no family history. Um, this, I'll just say, is a preview for Friday morning. Uh, Friday at 1 o'clock, actually, is the debate of the meeting this year, which um, turns out to be the question of should all breast cancer patients get tested for, BR for uh, genetic abnormalities? And that, of course, is nowhere near what Mary Claire would like to see, but uh, it just reminds you that's not what's happening in breast cancer, and that's part of what will be discussed or debated between Mark Robson and Susan Domchik. Should be quite a debate on Friday. And the last thing just to mention is that in the second 
general session today, there was an update on the 12 year outcome of IBIS II, which was the European version of tamoxifen versus um, anastrozole, and really showed very little difference between the two drugs in efficacy, very little difference in the breast cancers in the sources of outcome. Really, the differences, what there were, were in toxicity. Um, that there were endometrial cancers and ovarian cancers, interestingly, in the tamoxifen group. There was an excess of stroke and TIA in the anastro in the um, letrozole group, which was surprising, anastrozole, the anastrozole group, um, and that otherwise at 12 years there was uh, both, I mean, both were tremendously effective in preventing breast cancer, but they were uh, largely equivalent. Um, so I think it's just a an update on the long-term outcome of these investments. And the good news that they were still showing effectiveness at 12 years, even though women took the drugs for five. So there was a long tail on the curve, which otherwise, I mean, if that were not there, you'd be much less interested in considering taking medication with side effects for breast cancer prevention. That's all. Dr. Love? Okay, well, there was, you know, surgery is really not becoming less and less important in terms of breast cancer. Um, certainly when I started in the field, um, surgery was the key thing, you know, we, and the studies you would have seen at a meeting like this were, were um, Veronese uh, study, which was um, a radical mastectomy versus quadrantectomy um, that women were randomized for. Um, then you had Bernie Fisher, with lumpectomy versus uh, mastectomy, and and the whole meeting was surgery. And now you hardly hear anything about surgery. Um, it's just become much less important. And and with neoadjuvant treatment, where you give the drugs first, it becomes even less important. Um, however, um, that the area that that I'm really interested in, and finally making some progress in, and there was some, some stuff was about this is is understanding the breast, the anatomy of the breast, and DCIS, and how breast cancer starts. Because I think, you know, in my adult lifetime, I, I often say that uh, we figured out cancer of the cervix. When I started as a surgeon, if you had an abnormal pap smear, you had a hysterectomy. And now we know that it's caused by a virus and we have a vaccine. So if we could figure out how and why it starts and where it starts, we, we really could get somewhere. Um, the, the DCIS studies, which are which were talked about, are the early stages, you know, of breast cancer, and they they showed that that maybe you could leave out radiation, certainly in the grade one and two DCIS, that we we sort of went backwards. So we went from if you're going to do lumpectomy and radiation for 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 invasive breast cancer, then you should do do wide excision and radiation for DCIS. And now they're saying maybe we don't need the radiation uh, for DCIS. Um, and uh, there was a study um, looking at anastrozole and tamoxifen uh, for DCIS, and they were basically about the same. Uh, and tamoxifen, I think, is a little bit easier to take. Um, and, um, uh, and then there was another study looking at um, whole breast radiation versus, with a boost versus just whole breast radiation, and they said you don't need the boost. So all of these DCIS studies were sort of saying you need less than we thought rather than more, um, uh, in fact. Um, then there was a study of the microbiome of the breast, and I'm laughing because we're doing some work on this as well, but this was about, the, the, for some reason, all the studies on the microbiome of the breast figure out that the bacteria have to sort of catch an uber from the colon, a macrophage, to take it to the breast. And then, so if you study the, you know, the microbiome of the colon, you'll know what the breast is. Well, in actual fact, the breast gets sucked on by Tom, Dick, and Mary, um, kids, lovers. It has a direct root. Um, uh, for the microbiome. And um, it, it, once again, this was a study of looking at, at um, the GI tract as a source. So hopefully, and you'll see um, as I get now into my favorite part, um, uh, you'll see how we can maybe fix that. Um, and uh, so um, we had, there, was, there were a couple studies looking at margins again, as we always do. Um, and um, that's sort of the standard breast um, uh, reports. But actually, um, 
I, the, the exciting thing I, for me, my most exciting thing is something I've been trying to do my whole career and we had a poster on it and maybe we can show the poster. Um, I've been trying to map the anatomy of the human breast ducts and I've tried a million different ways. I had women with, with, who are lactating. I had all kinds of different things. Well now, and I don't know if you can see my pointer, but um, we now have figured out a way to do it. And it's using ultrasound. So you lay down with your breast hanging down in this vat of water, and then it's speed of sound ultrasound. The ultrasound waves come across and they measure how fast they come across and they can come up with an image. This is a 64 year old woman, this one, I don't know if you can see my arrow. So it's the one on, on your left side, if you're looking at them above, she's laying on her stomach. So her nipples down and the breast ducts are going up around it. This really straight one is a, is a vein. The part that has a lot is actually the, goes to the armpit, which doesn't surprise you because there's, it's a bigger area. This is in the middle part, is a shorter area, and there's an inner group and an outer group. So the thing that you should notice most of all is there's no quadrants, that the breast is not in quadrants. It's not like a pizza, and we don't have nice segments. And the reason that we get recurrences or, or, or dirty margins is because we haven't been able to map the ducts. This picture here, up here, um, up at the top corner on the right, you can see a little fleck of red and blue. That's a cancer in a duct, that red right there. Um, and here is some DCIS down in the, the white one. Um, that's DCIS in a duct. Um, uh, and I have just, right now I have 3D models of these three, but that's all I have. But we're, we were just about to start, since this is done in ultrasound, to map a lot of women where we're going to be able to say, is everybody the same? Are there like three different variants? Um, what, you know, what's the difference? And then we could, if somebody has an abnormality or even microcuspications, you could do this ultrasound, figure out where, what, where it is. And then theoretically, I mean, my fantasy is you then do a liquid biopsy of that duct because you can, you can numb up the nipple and cannulate the ducts, wash it out, get some, ab get the cells and because you know which one to go in and then squirt the treatment down the duct. So uh, to me, this is the beginning of the end. Um, I've been trying to do this my whole career and now I can't retire <laughs> because I have a new way to solve the problem I've been trying to solve all along. But anyway, I'm very excited about it. And it shows you too why we often get you know abnormal margin, dirty margins because people take out a wedge of tissue like it's a, a pizza and it's not. It's three-dimensional, and we really need to uh, be able to preoperatively map it. Anyway, so I'm excited. Dr. Lee? Dr. Lee? Dave. Dave. Uh, thanks. So I get to be the anchor leg of this relay. Um, yeah. And I wanted to present the uh, two MIC abstracts that were in the early morning uh, session. And I, I want to do that for two reasons. One is that um, some of us, I, but I was on a program committee and my job was to review tumor biology. Uh, and I thought these two were worthy of an oral presentation. So I wanted to see if I was right or wrong. And I think I was right. These were really very interesting abstracts. Uh, the second reason goes back a long time to my training. So uh, when I started training, uh, oncogenes were starting to be developed and recognized. And most people uh, review found out the oncogenes came from chicken viruses. So chicken viruses that uh, infect chickens had the ability to form tumors. So there were several that were identified, SARC, MYC, CRB2, which we later have learned to come to know as CRB2. Um, so an interesting thing about that hypothesis was that, well, chickens can get cancer from viruses. And actually, Peyton Rouse uh, won a, a Nobel Prize for making that observation. Uh, I, I looked it up. It was in the 60s. And interesting, that was the same year he co-shared the prize with uh, Charles Huggins. And Charles Huggins uh, was a scientist who actually figured out that androgens and steroid hormones had something to do with prostate cancer. But at any rate, that was the observation. 
So when I started my career as an oncologist, this was uh, a hot topic. And at the same time, nobody quite understood exactly how they worked. Uh, Dr. Varmus, Harold Varmus and Michael Bishop studied the uh, oncogenic viruses and they discovered something very interesting. And that was the viruses in the Rouse sarcoma virus, uh, the virus that Rouse discovered was actually stolen, if you will, from the chicken. Uh, and then put into the virus, it was slightly structurally different, and then that virus went back and, and caused tumors. So as you probably know, they won the Nobel Prize for that observation. I always like to tell that story because it shows that you can win the Nobel Prize for making the same observation, when the virus causes cancer and exactly how the virus causes cancer. So as I mentioned, when I started, uh, Mick, um, HER2, C, HER2, also known as HER2, were hot topics. The reason they were hot topics is because they were the first oncogenes that showed they had to do something with human cancer. You know, chicken cancer is pretty interesting, and uh, you can learn a lot by studying chickens and mice and their viruses. But the two clinical observations was that uh, amplification of these two genes, particularly NMIC in neuroblastoma, pediatric tumors, led to a worse outcome. The second observation was CRB2 or HER2 or NU, whatever you wanted to call it at the time, gene amplification also led to poor outcome for women with breast cancer. So um, just as another piece of history, that observation was made in a collaboration with Dennis Lehman and the late Bill McGuire, the same Bill McGuire that, uh, about the McGuire Award. Uh, and the reason it was high impact was because uh, it was kind of the first two observations that the oncogenes that people discovered in the lab had anything to do with cancers. So the HER2 story is uh, famous, and it has clearly shown how cancer outcomes can be improved by studying um, the basic findings. Mick, on the other hand, has been a little bit of a mystery, and I still think it, it remains a mystery. But the two abstracts that were presented today shed a little bit light on what Mick might do. So Mick, like her, her two is an oncogene. Uh, it is amplified in somewhere about 16, 20% of all breast cancers, roughly the same ballpark as her two. Um, it is also associated with poor prognosis in breast cancer, just like it is in pediatric neuroblastoma. But the hard part about this uh, is it's a transcription factor, which are notoriously hard to target. Unlike her two, which is an enzyme, which was modestly easy to target, uh, this has not been the case. So the two uh, uh, abstracts that were presented back to back, two talks, one was from Dr. Demiola and the Mitsiandis lab, uh, showed uh, they were very interested in studying cells that persisted after chemotherapy. Uh, so they used model systems to show that you can treat cells with chemotherapy, they'll get smaller, and then they'll sit there and stay there for a while. And the question was, what was wrong with those cells? So they showed that Two things weren't wrong with those cells. One was they didn't acquire a lot of new mutations. Uh, and the second thing they showed was they didn't grow out of pre-existing clones. Now, I actually think that may be a little bit of part of the model system they were using. But on the other hand, it helped support what they were going to show later, and that those cells had MYC amplification, but the genes MYC was associated with activating uh, were no longer uh, uh, expressed. So remember, MYC is a, uh, uh, is a transcription factor. It causes genes to be expressed. These MYC was still there, but it wasn't working anymore. So they liken this to something called embryonic diapause, and that's actually something I didn't know anything about. But apparently, embryos at day roughly four and a half go into a state they call diapause. And uh, Dr. Demiola made it very clear that diapause was not merely stopping growing. It was protecting cells from cellular stress. So that's just like treating cancer cells. Uh, they're trying to protect themselves from cellular stress. Uh, and it is also not a surprise that cancer cells learn how to use something they actually learned in new in embryonic life, and that was to sort of duck and cover. Basically, you're being attacked. You want to protect yourself. So that observation was interesting. They went and looked in a clinical database from a neoadjuvant chemotherapy trial using epirubicin and docetaxel. Uh, and they actually showed that 
um, the diapause and the suppression of MYC target genes was true, even though MYC was still there. So they went on to show that, well, that's interesting. So MYC is still there. It's just not functioning anymore. So there must be some other transcriptional pathway that interacts with MYC. Uh, they didn't go too far down this pathway, except they did show that a CDK9 inhibitor uh, could actually reverse diapause and resensitize the cells to chemotherapy. Um, Dr. Garber talked about CDK4-6 inhibitors. So just as the name implies, there's more than six, there's nine, maybe 10, 11, uh, but that's a very specific inhibitor. So it gave some uh, thought that maybe you could block another pathway to make chemotherapy more sensitive, just like we can block CDK4-6 and make endocrine therapy more sensitive. The second talk about MYC was from the GOGA lab, uh, and it was presented by Dr. Lee. Uh, the GOGA lab is at UCSF, and they are very interested in the ways that MYC could potentially cause immune suppression. So they study triple negative breast cancer, and as I mentioned, MYC causes a bunch of genes to be uh, transcribed. So if you call that a signature, with the MYC gene transcription signatures high, it's associated with much less uh, tumor cell infiltration. Um, so the idea that tumor cells, excuse me, associated much less lymphocyte infiltration into the tumor. So I think we have learned in the past several years that the more lymphocytic infiltration you have a tumor, the more likely you are to respond either to chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Uh, but they show the inverse correlation, uh, more MYC, um, less tumor cell infiltration. So they use the model system uh, where they could turn MYC on and off, and they actually showed that if you turn MYC off, then the checkpoint inhibitors work a little bit better. Uh, so how does that work? Uh, the checkpoint inhibitors uh, block a um, immune checkpoint called PD-1, PD-L1, uh, and the other thing that has to happen is that antigens have to be presented to the lymphocyte, and that's through the class one, uh, MHC class one. So MHC class one is downregulated by MYC. So in other words, and Sandy asked me to tell this analogy, but so I'll do it. Um, tumor cells have the ability to shield themselves from the immune system. And I always liken this to the Jedi mind trick seen in the original Star Wars. In the original Star Wars, uh, if everybody remembers this, uh, when Luke and Obi-Wan bring C-3PO and R2-D2 into Tatooine and the stormtroopers are looking for it, uh, Obi-Wan does the Jedi mind trick and says, these are not the droids you're looking for. Well, so tumor cells can do that a little bit to lymphocytes. So the idea that, yes, well, we're foreign here, but you shouldn't recognize this as part of the immune checkpoint inhibitor story, but also part of the antigen presentation. So MIT turns down the ability for antigens to be presented to the, teeth, the immune cells, uh, so partially doing the Jedi mind trick. The good part about that is you can overcome this. Uh, there's a uh, therapy called CPG. Uh, CPG is just a little short set of uh, nucleic acids that can stimulate um, toll-like receptors. Um, there's another checkpoint called OX40, and in their model system, OX40 and CPG work uh, well in combination and made tumors that were cold from MYC hot again and susceptible to immune checkpoint response. They did a very small peek into the iSpy data set and iSpy is a neoadjuvant therapy, and when Pembro uh, was used in that data set, we, had, we saw, I'm part of the iSpy group, uh, we saw good responses, and in fact, um, if you had a low mix signature, in other words, you weren't doing the, your tumor was not doing the Jedi mind trick, uh, you had better event-free survival. A very small subset, it's kind of hypothesis generated. But I think it, to me, I, again, I was interested in this because it really brings you back to there's an oncogene in breast cancer. What is it doing? And I think now as we're starting to appreciate both uh, protection from chemotherapy, insults, so to speak, the embryonic diapause story, as well as suppressing the immune system, uh, we may have a role for MYC and there may be some strategies to try to overcome that suppression. So uh, that was my, uh, what I wanted to present. And um, I always said too, I'm very happy to be here. This is the favorite part of the symposium. Uh, like Dr. Chang, I'm sorry we can't be there in person, uh, but the fun part of this is taking your questions. So I think that's what we're doing next. 
yeah, we've got some questions coming in and um, some I will direct specifically if they're asking me to, or otherwise you guys can jump up and decide who wants to take the question. Um, and again, we all miss seeing you guys and hope, hopefully next year we can all be together again. Um, this, the first question um, is, can you address the finding in the DCIS study that was presented today that found among other things that tamoxifen given as a preventative was linked to higher incidence and deaths from ovarian and endometrial cancer? So I can answer the endometrial cancer. I don't know that I can do the ovarian cancer. So that the endometrial cancer is a well-known complication of tamoxifen. Remember that tamoxifen is, you know, it binds to the estrogen receptor, and we all know there are estrogen receptors all over. And in the breast, it turns the receptor off, basically. Um, and that's what you want it to do to block the interaction between estrogen and its receptor and not let the cells proliferate. But in the uterine lining, tamoxifen, when it binds to the receptor, actually turns it on. And that is like giving estrogen without progesterone or birth, you know, that which we know increases uh, endometrial cancer risk. So that was not a surprise. I think the ovarian excess was a surprise. It was eight cases in a large study, but it was certainly uh, different. And I think we have to go back and look at that again. I don't think there's any reason to think this was related to any kind of genetic predisposition that ended up in the um, in the um, tamoxifen arm of that study. Um, and we have a lot of other studies to look at where tamoxifen has been given either for treatment or prevention where ovarian cancer risk has not been increased. But still, it was um, a little disturbing, so I'm sure we will go back and do that. Next question, is there any new way to reconstruct after mastectomies, any new technologies? Well, I'm the surgeon, so I guess I'm supposed to answer that, but uh, I'm not, I, I really haven't paid much attention to reconstructing te technology, so I can't. So maybe somebody else knows something. Well, I can answer a little bit because in the prevention world, we have patients with mutations who are having preventive surgery. Um, so I think, you know, it depends how you, what you count as new, and I'm sure Doug and Jenny and Susan can add to this. Um, there, you know, I would say what's newer is the idea that women can keep their nipples more often, even when there's been a breast cancer, depending on the location of the tumor. Um, there's been a move to put the implants in on top of the muscle instead of having to have an expander and then have the, uh, um, the implant put behind the muscle, which was, has been the standard way for a long time now. I would say both are happening much more often. There are still concerns about the implants themselves, and you know that there was a big issue with the FDA, particularly for textured implants. So if you have implants, you can find out um, what kind you have, and there is no, I mean, that there's not a recommendation from the FDA or the reconstructive surgeons um, that all such implants be removed, but they are looking at them more closely. There's been a move toward more in reconstruction using your own tissue, if you have enough, um, mostly from the abdomen, some from the other parts of the body, like the back or the shoulder, uh, trying not to disturb the muscles. So I'd say there, there's been work on this. It's, um, there's also been work on trying to measure how women feel about their mastectomies and reconstructions. The surgeons have worked on developing instruments for patient reported outcomes, which we'll hear about more at this meeting, uh, to try and make sure that they really are assessing um, whether, you know, is this a good thing? So much move toward more mastectomies, which everybody's uncomfortable about. Um, how do we know that this is doing the right thing for women? Susan's talking about less surgery. Um, and here are efforts to try and at least make surgery when it is done at, to mastectomy better. But I don't think anybody is 
fully satisfied that this is the best sleep that can be done. And I'm not a surgeon. I should just say that up front. And, and, uh, uh, and I, I just want to say that that one of the things about the mapping that that we can do now and once we'll be able to to do this better is you'll know if you'll know how big the ductal system is that has the cancer so you'll know how much tissue you need to get out whereas right now we just guess and we say things like you know quadrantectomy when the when the ducts aren't in quadrants at all and so it may be that if it's in one of the smaller ducts um, you could take out less tissue um, or you could squirt something down the duct, as I said, and, and change it that way. So I think that that the ability to understand the breast actually will also help us um, do less in terms of surgical. This next question is for you, Dr. Love. Um, will you try to map the male breast with your new system? Absolutely, I will. But the problem I have at the moment is that you have to lay with your breast hanging down. So I don't know, I, I may have to get men who are heavier. So, so, they, so they have something to hang. hang. But um, you know, once we, we're getting a machine and um, we were all ready to go and then the pandemic came, but we will be looking at men. We also wanna look at you know women at different times before, after you breastfeed, are you the same you know, as you were before? We want to look at um, women of different ages. Does it change with the menstrual cycle? It turns out the company that um, developed this technology has images that they took. Um, they have a thousand images. And so we're now trying to put together a team to, to analyze them. And so we'll get a head start. So as soon as the pandemic rises, we'll know who we need to, who we want to uh, recruit and who we don't. But the great thing about it is it's ultrasound. So if you do it, you know, if you have to, if you want to do it before and after lactation, you could do it before and after, and there's no risk to it. Um, this is a follow-up question. Would lobular breast cancer show up on the breast duct mapping? It should, because the lobules are at the end of the ducts. So it should, almost like, you know, grapes at the end of a branch kind of thing. Um, so we should be able to, to see the lobules as well. Um, and at least we'll know then, if you know what duct the lobule is connected to, you, you would know which opening. That work we've done, we did in the past. So I know where the holes are and the nipple and where they, you know, where they uh, lead to. Um, I just didn't have a way of knowing where the tumor was in relationship or the pathology. And so I think, th so this is what I've been trying for, you know, for years. <laughs> so I'm very excited. And I wish there wasn't a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> um, next question. This is for Dr. Yi. Um, is it MK or MEK? Is it a mutation which, uh, according to the abstracts you were referring to? Um, the, uh, okay, so the MYC is MYC. <laughs> and, it's G, and there's basically too many copies, G, gene amplification. Um, you don't see a lot of mutation, e even in her too. The the uh, mouse and chickens, you will see mutation, but not so much in humans. It's just too much of the gene. Um, another question for Dr. Yi, and I'm not real sure exactly what they're saying, but it's um, it's a concept of diapose is interesting. Is this something that could be explored in cancer dormancy? Yeah, I, I don't know as much about this as I guess I should and read up a little bit more on. But one of the points of the speaker, Dr. DiMiola, was it is not just dormancy. It's actually active protection. So you turn on a variety of different programs to make sure the nutrients are available to protect yourself from other sort of uh, hypoxic insults. So it's uh, MIC is a very interesting gene in terms of the numbers of time, uh, different uh, programs that can affect. Uh, and the argument was in diapause, you turn um, essentially off all the things that are associated or required for continued growth. At the same time, genes go up and down when you change the transcription factor. You will turn on genes important for just surviving the uh, stressful environmental conditions, if you will. Um, this next question is from everybody, and it's actually, I'm going to say who it's from because he's one of my favorite advocates, and he did a um, 
chat um, on male breast cancer on, I think it was Monday. Um, it's from Bob Ritter, and he says, as our genomic understanding of breast cancer expands, I think that community hospitals are less and less able to provide state-of-the-art care. Will community hospitals be able to keep up? Uh -huh. Good question. <laughs> oh. I, okay, I'll take this, about this one. I think breast cancer is very, very common. And I think it, you know, it behooves uh, well-trained uh, teams to be dedicated to the care of breast cancer patients. Uh, and it should be done closer to home. You know, I think, um, you know, I, I, I can't imagine needing to drive every day for three weeks, four weeks for radiation therapy when you have, you know, school, school age kids, et cetera, et cetera. So but I, what I think is important are teams, whether it's tumor war teams that basically keep up to date and only do perhaps breast cancer. Um, I think if you do that and you have these um, um, groups of people in the community hospitals, it probably um, can be done in community hospitals and should be done in community hospitals because at the end of the day, uh, the reason why we basically do radiation um, closer to home and the, the, all the rationale for all of that um, is so that basically you maximize um, uh, patient care with convenience and life. Now, if you have metastatic disease, that's different and you want to go for experiments with clinical trials, et cetera, that's very different. Dr. Yee? Yeah, if I can comment. Um... So one of the silver linings of the pandemic has been that we are communicating now with each other in ways we never had been before. I mean, obviously this is an example of that. Uh, so at our institution, we have tried to open up our breast cancer tumor board to community physicians uh, through a Zoom meeting. Uh, at the same time, I'm sure that all of you have probably had uh, video virtual visits with your oncologist. So when you ask the question about how will community practices keep up, I would argue that we, it is our responsibility in the academic centers to make sure that we keep um, this virtual communication going uh, and, and that we make ourselves available to our colleagues. Uh, at the same time, it does require you, the patient and the advocate to ask for that uh, and it also requires your oncologist to be willing to actually reach out to, uh, to other people for an opinion. But at least in my particular practice, that happens, you know, several times a week. People have questions and I try to help and then sometimes just say, well, why don't you just get on our tumor board and present your case and see what people think. So that could happen more than it has happened in the past and we may be able to bring in the community hospitals uh, when the questions are tough. Okay. This next one, um, I'm sorry, did somebody want to say something else? Okay. Um, this next one is, could the panelists please speak to whether the presentations on CDK inhibitors make it likely that these medicines will be FDA approved for early stage ER positive disease? Is the data likely strong enough or should people be followed longer? And with the toxicities of CDK4-6 inhibitors and the cost, it's critical to find out who can benefit without suffering needless toxicities and expense. At the moment, it's with the FDA. I don't think we, you know, it's for them to decide. I think the data is the data. It, um, um, it, you know, it, it seems to be coming closer together, but the data still is positive at this time frame for them. I think we have to wait and see. Anybody else has any insights? I, I personally would like to see a little longer term follow up. You know, um, I can't remember which talk I saw it in, but it's commonly presented this way, not very commonly presented that people think about. So there is a graph where they graph hazard ratio on, uh, on the Y axis and time on the X axis. So it will show for some breast cancers that the risk of recurrence is high and then it goes down, but for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, it extends over a 10 or 15 year period. What I would like to see is that if we give a, a CDK4-6 inhibitor, we're actually pushing the whole curve down. We're not just pushing it out. 
um, if the long-term results show that we uh, just push out recurrences a year, the year that you were actually taking the CDK4-6 inhibitor in the adjuvant setting, uh, I don't know if that's in advance. I I'm happy to have other people weigh in on that, but I would really like to see uh, the at the time of when people are at risk, the risk goes down and it's just not prolonged. Because uh, I don't want to, I don't want to have a therapy that actually increases the risk of tumor dormancy um, that we have to deal with long-term uh, issues. So that that's kind of my concern. I agree. Um, this, go ahead. Judy, you're, you're uh, muted. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to be polite. No, I think Jenny spoke to the, you know, the, I think it's still really a mystery of why a femicyclin works and calvicyclin doesn't seem to. They, there are some differences in the drug, but it's a little hard to understand exactly why they should show this. So I think there's some caution um, about this. It is um, hard to understand why these drugs should make such a difference in the metastatic setting and mm -hmm. not such a difference here up front. They, they should have, so we need to sort this out better. Um, and the cost is a huge issue. Next one, there was a talk this morning about Ibrance having two negative trials, um, stating that it wasn't a significant benefit in the trials. Does this mean Ibrance isn't as effective as we once thought? It's very effective in the metastatic setting. So once you have metastatic breast cancer, Ibrance is the first drug. Well, this class of drugs is what we use for first line hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer patients. So this class of drugs, the CDK46, is this very effective. As, the, as Judy was saying, we were also hopeful that this would translate if you have early breast cancer into more cures, people, cancer not coming back and, pick, you know, et cetera. But seriously, the eye brands did not show that. Uh, we're still holding out for abemocyclic bisenio. Uh, we don't know if that will still hold out. It's still early days, but it's holding out at least a little bit. Um, so we just have to wait and see what the data shows. Um, and and I'm still hopeful that there will be a subset of women with early breast cancer that we can find out and that we can treat those patients, not everybody, but those patients, not just based on anatomic risk, but biological risk of relapse. Um, that those patients are the ones that we can give the CDK46 like a BMS method to. Um, next question. There was a discussion today concerning LCIS, and I got the impression that it was of more concern than DCIS. It also talked about how it like led to mirror cancer if one breast has a disease that's likely to be present in the other breast. Can you please address this? So who wants to take this? I don't want to. I missed that. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't see it either, but I can speak briefly to this. I mean, DCIS <laughs> yes. is, right? So there was a, a very elegant presentation on the molecular biology of DCIS, which doesn't address your question, but DCIS is most often felt to be a, a, not a necessary, but a frequent sort of precursor to breast cancer. Most breast cancers will have associated DCIS as if they arose from them. And the management of DCIS has become a big issue with worry that we're over treating DCIS by treating it too much like invasive breast cancer while trying to prevent the development of invasive breast cancer. And ultimately, of course, death from breast cancer. LCIS, <laughs> LCIS is a very bad name, lobular carcinoma in situ, for um, a lesion that is found in the breast and really is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer in both breasts. So it is true that in, you know, the DCIS, that's the spot where breast cancer is most likely to occur where the DCIS is found. But in LCIS, the risk of breast cancer is to both breasts. And in old data, they used to do, and I don't think Susan even was part of this trend <laughs> when she was a surgeon, but they used to do mirror biopsy. So they'd right. do bre they right. the breast cancer, and then they'd do the other side and see, was it there too? Yeah, exactly. Right. Same spot. Were. Yeah. But, um, 
but it's, it's, you know, everyone with breast cancer has got more risk of a second tumor on the other side. I know Susan has now anatomically driven out the breast, but they really are the same tissue on both sides and they're exposed to the same thing. So it's not a big surprise that there would be similar risk. I don't think this makes LCIS worse than DCIS, just different. Yeah. There's uh, almost you can, invariably... you can you hear me? Yeah, yes. there you go. Now we can. I think LCI is almost invariably expresses ER, estrogen receptor. So they're the most amenable to uh, chemo prevention, so to speak, with tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor. So I, I think there's a lot, you know, that can be done for LCIS, um, but it is a terrible name and it's, um, yeah. <laughs> it sounds yeah. like cancer, but it's not. Um, regarding when you the, get, oh, I'm when sorry. you get cancer, LCIS, you you usually get ductal cancer, which you don't get. It's not like it turns into cancer. Right, not usually, not usually, but sometimes. Next question regarding the imaging study that Constance Lehman presented: Is the work being done also looking at lobular breast cancers and evaluating differences in hot in well, and how ILC presents on images and challenges in dense breasts. Yes, they have a very comprehensive approach, not only ductal, but also lobular breast cancers, which you know are often missed on mammograms. So there's a big effort in part of this to see if there's some way to detect them using the artificial intelligence that is not seen by the naked eye. That was actually our last question. So any follow-up comments by anybody at all, or I will go ahead and close out. I would just say there's okay. a lot more to come in this meeting. So yeah. today was a sort of a maybe a little quieter entry, but you should definitely plan to be back tomorrow and Friday. There's much more to come. I was just gonna yeah. say that. Thank you. I would have Make also a pitch. There's a lot of good things on the online content, on the on-demand content. Um, yeah. You know, many of the I think all of the mini symposia are there, uh, and they're they're really worth uh, uh, taking a look at those. Yeah. And yesterday's educational content, they were great talks. Very good. Well, thank all of you for joining us for this first session of our hot topics. Um, and we look forward to seeing you guys um, tomorrow and Friday night as well. I want to thank our panelists. They were exceptional as always. And again, we love each and every one of you. And um, we really thank you for the generosity of your time. We so appreciate it. And we also want to thank our funders again. Without the panelists and our funders, we couldn't do this. So until tomorrow, good night. Good night. Thank you glass of wine. Bye.
I heard a glass of wine can prevent cancer or does it cause cancer? I don't think this video is about scolding those people that love and care and those people that have misstepped with their words. Have you tried yoga? Yeah, I have. I think this is really about the NBC community having a good laugh. Have you swam in Lake Tikitaka? Tiki. <laughs>